Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is so good. God is so good. His mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. True, the Lord is merciful. He's mighty. He's sovereign. He's holy. He's just. He's majestic. Doesn't matter what you're going through in this life. He's able to handle it. All your problems, all your cares, all your concerns. All you have to do is cast your cares upon the Lord. And he promises he will take care of it. But you have to have faith in God. That God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think. This has been a beautiful day, a relaxing day, and weather's been nice. Just to reflect on the goodness of God, where he brought us from. So many different things we've done over the years, good, the bad, the ugly. Yet God's goodness and his mercy covers us, follows us all the days of our lives. He don't change his mind about us because we change our minds. Sometimes we, we get things right. Sometimes we don't. But there's no reason to put ourselves in a guilt trip to where we find ourselves being buried in the pitfall of despair. But I found out a savior who knows all about what we're going through. He led the, the best example ever to help us get through all the trials and the tests in our lives by trusting and depending on his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to read a, today's devotional. And it says, from the book of more of you, God. Hallelujah. It says, God Almighty, today I thank you because I have been redeemed. Hallelujah. I have been re delivered and set free. All bondage has been removed off me. The shackles and the chains have been broken. I feel a sense of relief. My heart is no longer heavy. Baggage be gone, says the Lord. Now I feel like a bird or a butterfly, free. I'm enjoying the beauty of you, Lord. I am empowered by your blood, Lord Jesus. You have cleansed me and made me all new. My conscience is clear, have been restored from all guilt. I know all my sins have been forgiven by you, Lord Jesus. God, you love the world so much. You gave your only son, Jesus Christ, life on the cross for all transgressions. So as long as I believe in you, I should not perish. But now I have eternal life. Yes, without this most precious gift from you, God, I totally fall short from your glory. Now I can go on from glory to glory. I am renewed, refreshed, and restored with more of you, God. It is such a great delight and pleasure to know that we have been restored. We have been refreshed. We have been made new. We have been brought into righteousness. We have been justified. We have been set free from a guilty conscience washed in the blood of the Lamb from all our transgressions and our sins and unrighteousness, Jesus took it upon himself that we could live a free, a fruitful, and abundant, and a moral life in Christ Jesus. That is good news. That is exciting to know. Doesn't matter what your past look like. What matters is how you're living today. Because when Jesus Christ comes back, he's not going to ask you about your past. 
He's going to ask you, what did you do with my son? That's what God's going to ask you. God's going to say, what did you do with my son in today's life? How were you living? Have you lived submitted life to him? Have you been walking in truth and righteousness? What have you done with my son? And many of us, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your answer is going to be nothing. I've done nothing with Jesus. And he's going to say, take your part in the lake of fire for eternity. I don't know about you, but this is the day of salvation. This is the opportunity to get our lives right, to allow God to turn things around in our lives. He took away the shackles and the bondage and the chains. He, he broke us from the uh, spiritual prisons. And he gave us new life. And because of the new life, we have the right, we have the privilege to come before God and call him our Father and Jesus our Lord and the Holy Spirit will fill you with such a great joy and excitement that every day you can live your life as a pleasing sacrifice before God so let us pray before we go into our lesson tonight we started last week dealing with the spirit of heaviness and tonight we're gonna to continue with that subject the spirit of heaviness because I really believe that during this time of our lives, many people are, are suffering with mental torment of heaviness. Many people are bound with the spirit of heaviness. Many have struggled with the stronghold of heaviness and don't know how to be free. The same thoughts, the same habits, the same patterns, the same cycle, the same struggles, the same addictions. Many are struggling with the same problems and issues and do not know how to be free. But as we study th this book, The Strong Man, what's his name, what's his game, God is going to give you revelation that's going to help set you free from the bondage of sin that holds you in captivity to that stronghold called heaviness. But you have to want to be free. One thing about God, God will not violate your will. He will not force you to be free. He will not come into your life and demand you be free. But he commands you to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind, and thy strength. And love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the commandment of God. God commands every child of God to live by this principle. Of giving your life to him to love him above everything in your life and when you find yourself submitted to his authority his lordship the enemy becomes powerless in your life amen so father in the name of Jesus Lord we're so honored to come into your presence once again I say thank you Lord God that you sent your son Jesus to be the propitiation or to stand in a gap for our sins that we will not be judged according to our sinful nature but that we'll be set free by the power of the blood of the lamb he paid the price on Calvary's cross that we can receive the new life your word tells us, therefore, if any man be in Christ, Jesus is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And tonight, God, we thank you that we have been bought with the price. We've been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, God, we have the right and the privileges to come before your presence, giving you thanks. Lord, tonight... I'm believing, God, that somebody or many people will hear this word, Father God, and something will be said that will inspire them, that will trigger in their hearts, oh God, a belief system that believe hope against hope, to have faith in God, that you're able to break the power of the stronghold of the enemy called heaviness, to strip it out of their lives, oh God out of their mindsets because I realize God many problems originate from a thought 
Our thought life determines how we live, how we think, and how we will behave. And when we come to the place of recognizing that something in our thought life is not right, God, you reveal it by the Holy Spirit that you will purge it out of our consciousness. And tonight, God, I'm asking you to purify us, O oh God, by your Holy Spirit. Let the fire burn inside of us, O oh God, to break the shackles and the chains in our lives, O oh God, that we walk by faith and not by sight. God, is about you being glorified, about you being exalted. God, you're faithful, you're sovereign, you're holy. God, there's no one else like you in all the earth, oh God. Father, draw us to that place in you, God, where nothing else would matter, but as we humble ourselves for the mighty hand of God, that you would lift us up in due season, that we will receive the new life of freedom. We will accept, accept the fact, oh God, that you paid the price to set us free. That we walk by faith and not by sight into this freedom. To no longer be bound with the spirit of heaviness, oh God. That you would take the heaviness and lift it off our shoulders, God. And because it to be lifted up, oh God, on wings of faith. To soar above our problems. Because your words are, but they that wait on the Lord, he shall renew their strength. Even when sometimes our strength feels weakened. You said they shall mount up upon wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Even in our moments of despair, of weariness, you said, God, you will cause us not to faint. Because if we faint in the days of adversity, our strength is small. But I found out, God, just as you told Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient that in your weaknesses, my power is made strong in you. Then Paul responded, Then I rather glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Now, Lord God, come and fill us with your presence. Fill us with your divine revelation, the unction of the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God. Begin to fill us now with a rhema word, God, that's spoken from your heart that would change our mindsets change our attitudes cleanse our hearts and cause the walk father god with the power and authority that's been given to our hands over all the powers of the enemy and that we stand fast in the liberty where christ has made us free and i thank you lord god in jesus name amen hallelujah to the lamb of god hallelujah glory to god in the highest Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 6, 61. Isaiah chapter 61 is our key verse for tonight, verse 1 through 3. In the English Standard Version, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news. To bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to grant to those who mourn in Zion, and to give them beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So, as Isaiah has declared the prophetic word, he was speaking a word to the people, God's people, children of Israel, to remind them that God is in control of their lives. That God wants to exchange your heaviness for beauty in place of the ashes, which refers to those who have died when you're mourning, you're grieving over a loss of a loved one. God wants to give you gladness instead of mourning. A garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. 
Many times we find ourselves victimized by the spirit of heaviness because we're not getting to God's word. We're not allowing the word to get into our hearts. So we find ourselves being victimized by the enemy, falling into the trap of a, of, of a heavy spirit that causes us to be imprisoned in our mindsets. So when we imprison in our mindsets, the enemy keeps you in a place where you can't get out. He wants you to dwell on all the things that have broken your heart, the things that hurt you, the things that cause you to be bound up in, 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 in selfishness and pride and misery and gloom and, and all this stuff, gloom, doom, and all those things that, that take away your joy. He don't want you to be excited. He don't want you to, to, be, to praise God. He don't want you to worship God. He doesn't want you to turn your, your morning into dancing. He wants you to turn your morning into sorrow to where you continue to be grieving and bitter and full of anxiety and stress and worrying about things that are not in your power to change. So God's word says in Proverbs chapter 12 verse 25 says anxiety in a man's heart. You're worrying. Anxiety is another word for worrying. Your worries that's in your heart weighs you down. So many people worry about how I'm going to pay my bill, how I'm going to get my car fixed, how I'm going to keep my lights on, how I'm going to take care of my children, how I'm going to find another job. I lost my job, so how am I going to do this? So we worry. Instead of seeking God's faith and trusting in God's word, we find ourselves turning to the spirit of heaviness and we worry. And worry will keep you in a condition of hopelessness. Because it, it wants to strip your faith away from you to keep you from trusting and depending on God. So in our lesson tonight, Isaiah declares the spirit of heaviness is a symptom that comes from the strong man. And his attributes is excessive mourning. We talked about this last week, excessive mourning. Where when you get into your grieving state because of the loss of a loved one, instead of you getting over it, you continue to grieve. You have people who lost their loved one, someone who dear, who, who's close to them 25 years ago, and they're still holding, holding on to the pain and the hurt of losing their loved one. Never progress past it because their mindset will not let it go. It's nothing wrong with grieving, but if you find yourself stuck in the mindset of, of sorrow over the same thing that happened 25 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years ago, you're bound by a strong man called the spirit of heaviness. The spirit of heaviness, it produces sorrow, it produces depression, it brings you to a place of despair where nobody can help me dejection, which is sadness, hopelessness, self-pity, loneliness, disappointment, insomnia. That's another point that happens with, with heaviness. You can't sleep because you're restless from worrying. Worrying will cause you to toss and turn all night long trying to figure out how to get out of certain situations. You may have hurt somebody. Instead of you going to make things right with that person, you hold on to the pain and the, and the disbelief of what you've done to hurt somebody else. Instead of asking them to forgive you and will forgive yourself even, you hold on to that pain and you never progress past it. The enemy knows that I can keep you bound up with the spirit of heaviness with the inner hurts and the bruises that I afflict on myself, I afflict on other people. I will never progress past this state of mind. Why? Because he knows if I can keep you bound up, I can keep you attached to this stronghold. The enemy knows that he, he, if he can get a hold to you in one way or another to turn your faith, to looking in your situation and your problems and not depending or relying on God to heal and deliver and set you free, he can keep you in a, in a state of imprisonment, a state of imprisonment. We let other people imprison us because people will remind you of your mistakes. People will want to hold you in captivity to, to the past failures. People 
want to play the broken record of your uh, failures and your disappointments and your discouragements, your pains, your inner hurts. People want to remind you of all this stuff because they don't want to see you do any better. We have people come into our lives with a purpose to assassinate your purpose. You know what I just said? People will come into your life with a purpose to assassinate your purpose. Because they know if I can deter your faith, turn your eyes from God to looking at yourself, I can destroy your faith in trusting in God. So the enemy knows that the symptoms of the spirit of heaviness have to be dealt with before we can progress past anything else in our lives. If you don't allow the spirit of God to come into your heart and you cast your cares upon him because he cares about you, you're going to find yourself in a place where you're going to be drifting. You're going to be drifting in a pathway of destruction and you never find yourself finding the pathway of that's narrow the word calls that leads to life and peace so you never have no peace because you're being tormented the enemy brings torment then he brings fear then he brings discouragement then he strips you of your power because he knows if I can strip you of your power from trusting and depending on God's word you ain't going nowhere I got you bound you're my prisoner, and I'm going to command you to do what I want you to do because you're not standing on God's word. You're not trusting in God's word. You're not believing in God's word. So whatever it is he wants to do through you, that's what you're going to do. It is normal and healthy to have a period of mourning after the loss of a loved one or even a favorite possession, a job position a pet, a boy, or a girlfriend. Whenever we lose something that we highly value, it takes time to adjust both physically and psychologically to vacuum that results. When things happen, when we lose things that are, are, are prizing or possessive to our hearts or close to our hearts, it takes time to process it in your psyche. But once you process it, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to cause us to move past it. Give us the power, give us the strength, give us the ability to progress past it. Grief is God's given emotions that allows us to empty out the deep feelings that must not be kept on the inside. Grief, if long continues, it becomes a neurotic system a return to immaturity and therefore is destructive. The enemy knows if I can keep you in the state of mourning, I can cause you to revert back to immaturity where you don't grow or progress in the things of God. Then it becomes destructive to your spiritual growth because if I can keep you in, in a state of immaturity, then it's okay to cuss people out. It's okay to progress your anger, project your anger towards somebody else. It's okay to stamp on other people because you're hurting. Why? Because that's the mindset of immaturity and destructive mechanism the enemy uses against you to hurt you. We call ourselves hurting other people, but in the process, we're really hurting ourselves. The most, we're not really hurting other people as bad as we think we are. We're really hurting ourselves. We're damaging our relationship with God. We all allow the comforter, if we allow the comforter to heal the hurt, to carry our grief, surely the, the words of Isaiah 53. Turn to Isaiah 53, verse 3. Isaiah 53, verse 3 and 4. And 5. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 through 5. Three four, three, four, and five. And it says in the King James, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, 
smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. In the NIV version it reads like this. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering. And familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our sufferings. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus paid the price for you and for me. He took our punishment. He took our afflictions. He took our sorrows. And it says it appeared as he was being punished by God. But yet he did it for our sake. That you and I could be set free to not have to bear the same pain the same sufferings, the same sorrow, the same struggles, the same problems. He did all of this so you and I can be set free. But we have to be willing to get to the place within ourselves to allow the Spirit of God to reveal to you what is your problem. To reveal to you what's the root cause of your problem and reveal to you how to overcome your problem. You have to be willing to allow the Spirit of God to move on the inside of you to purify your thoughts and your actions. That you stand on God's Word because God's Word has the power to deliver you. He has the power to set you free. It has the power to break the shackles and the chains off your mind and off your heart. But you have to be willing to surrender your all in all to the Lord. The physical health of those involved is affected and the spirit of fear usually moves in somewhere along the line when we give in to the spirit of heaviness. When death is magnified, it creates fear. How many times can we recount the details of how someone died without being affected by the whole process? Especially if it was excessive violence or morbid. God's people do not concentrate on their attentions on death, but on Christ, who is life. We talked about this last week. But this one thing I do, as Paul says, Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, 14, Paul puts it this way. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because if I don't keep pressing forward, I find myself degressing backwards. Sorrow and death will bring you to a place of fear. They bring you to a place of paralysis when you won't do anything else with your life. You're stopping your track. You stop trying to even get better. You stop trying to get over the sorrow. You stop trying to allow God to heal your heart. Why? Because you're paralyzed by the fear of what has just happened to you. A person dies that you were close with instead of recognizing this person as a child of God who was a child of God that died if they were, that they're, they're now in the presence of the Lord. But the problem comes in when we see that person that was close to us, that we knew there was a child of God, they died, we don't get past it. So we hold on to the grief, we hold on to the sorrow. Isaiah assures us that God wants to turn our ashes or our death experiences into something beautiful. God can make something beautiful out of nothing. God can make something beautiful out of death. God can make something beautiful out of your pain. God can make something beautiful out of your sorrows. God can make something beautiful out of your depression. But you got to be willing to say, okay, God, I can't handle it anymore. I tried it my way. My way didn't work. 
So I'm tired, God. Now come into my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Take control. God will do just what he promised to do when we surrender to him. Then he says, we put on the garment of praise by thanking God for the time he gave us with our loved ones here on earth. Put on a garment of praise. Put on a garment of praise. You have to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to strip you of the old nature, the old mindset, the old attitude, the old characteristics, and begin to put you on a garment of praise, which is exemplifies the body of Christ being clothed and engrafted in him, that his presence begin to surround you and embrace you and cover you. If they were Christians, then we know when the person died, they're enjoying the presence of the Lord. We have to be willing to move on. We reflect on the positive areas of their lives and keep them in our memories. So even when a person dies, we can always remind ourselves of the good times we shared with that person. We can always remind ourselves of the good times we spent with them. And do not allow ourselves to get into a place of self-pity and misery where it takes control of our lives. Because people will find themselves in a place of self-pity. Self-pity usually results from selfish motives. We resent the fact that we have been left alone to cope while our loved ones are off walking in the streets of gold. Isn't that something? And people actually think like this. That when a person died, they left me. They abandoned me. Why you leave me down here by myself? I don't have nobody else to run to. I have nobody else to turn to. I have nobody to rely on. Why you die? Why, you, why God had to take your life from me? Why God had to, have to take you from me when you were close to me? Selfish. We become selfish because God has a reason for allowing people to die. We don't have the power to, 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 to keep them here. Neither do we have the power to let them go. The only way we can overcome these things is by giving in to the Spirit of God and allowing the Spirit of God to take control of our thought life to deal with the process of them gone. God knows when your time is up on this earth. The Bible says life is but a vapor. We're here today and gone tomorrow. So in other words, it's no guarantee of how your life is going to end or when it's going to end. But you have to be in preparation every day of your life. Live your life as if it is the last day on earth. Giving God the glory and the praise because without him, your life is nothing. God knows what's best for you. Sometimes we can cause other people to be our crutch to hinder our growth. Sometimes people in our lives that are so close to us prevent us from moving forward into the promise God has for our lives. See, there's so many different reasons we can we can dwell on and think about the reason why God allowed people to leave, from, leave us in this life and pass on to, to glory is because God loves us so much. He wants us to progress in our Christian walk. We cannot progress if we're holding on to our crutches. You ever had a broken leg or surgery where you had to walk on crutches? You needed those crutches for a period of time until the process was completely healed in your body. Whatever it is that happened that caused you to have to walk on crutches, you had to do that for a season. But once your body replenished itself and healed itself, you let go of the crutches. Why? Because now it's time to progress, to move on. The same way it is when a loved one dies in our lives, God wants you to move on, to keep on progressing, keep on maturing, keep on growing, keep on learning about him, keep on sharing the gospel, keep on studying his word, keep the word in your heart and in your mouth, and let, do not let it part from you because the word is your life. God's word is your life. And the enemy knows if I can deceive you, get you to a place of sorrow, I can keep you from progressing. Loneliness strikes and we're tempted to retreat into a shell and give up. You know what? That, that's that's a, a, a very vital subject right there. Loneliness. I don't know if you ever experienced loneliness. When I moved here from Texas, been about four years ago now, 
I, I was I was kind of fearful. I was apprehensive because I just went through a divorce and now I have to learn how to live alone. That was the most toughest, the most challenging, the hardest thing for me. It's like I lost someone in death and now I'm learning how to live alone by myself. I ended up seeking a psychiatrist because there was so much going on in my mind after the divorce and I'm, I'm like, God, why you let this happen to me? Why, why, why you didn't stop this? You could have stopped this. You could have turned things around. You could have caused things to work out. But God knew that there's a time in our lives we had to separate from other people in our lives in order for us to grow. I was already growing, true enough. I was studying God's word. I was preaching God's word all the time. I was always in the word doing what I wanted to do. But there came times where I felt abandoned. I felt like no one cared about me. I had nobody to call on, no one to turn to, no one to lean on, no one to be by my side but God. And God came in and began to encourage me by the Holy Spirit. After seeing a psychiatrist, he began to unlock the things in my life that were buried from a childhood up to my adulthood life. Everything that was in my heart, in my secret treasure box, God revealed and exposed those things for me to move on. So once I started recognizing that being by myself was the best place to be because it gave me more time to spend in God's presence. And as I spent time in God's presence, I started growing spiritually. My eyes became open even more to the things of God. And now I can tell other people, it doesn't matter what you've been through, what you're going through. God is with you from the beginning to the very ending of your life. So I want to encourage you, don't give up. Keep moving forward. Allow the Spirit of God to walk with you and guide you in the path of truth and righteousness. God promised to be with us, working everything out for our good. When you thread pass through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Isaiah 43, verse 2. Isaiah 43, verse 2. Romans 8, verse 28. So God promises that no matter what you go through, I will, the great I am, the King of glory, will be with you. Amen. So as we continue to move on to the next subject in this book, we deal with depression. Let me read something here. Broken relationships. We'll start right here. Another subject, broken relationships. The death of relationship leaves one or both parties involved uh, really from the after effects of the hurt. My, my, my. Satan often uses misunderstanding to thrust his fiery darts and to cause deep wounds in our spirits and our souls. He tries to kill the unity of friends, loved ones, and the members of the body of Christ. Broken relationships. Our first response the broken relationships need to be the one of asking for forgiveness of God. If you're in a broken relationship, your first response needs to be asking God for forgiveness. If possible, the other person, the involved, involved as well. So we have to go and make things right between yourself and God and the other person. Second, we must forgive the other person by, by the act of our wills and keep it committed to Christ. Because we have to surrender our will to God, walk in forgiveness, and ask the other person to forgive us in order to be committed to Christ. We can't afford to go back and play with the details of the problems anymore. We must practice bringing every thought into obedience and thinking only on the good report and the pure things from God's word. Binding the work of the enemy and walking out forgiveness is a continual process as God does his healing in our spirits by restoring the wholeness of our lives that we need. It will often take some time before we stop hurting, but we can be assured 
that we're not holding on to anger, guilt, unforgiveness, or any other thing that might open the door to the access of this destroyer. So we got to recognize where we are, who's behind the attacks in our lives, and allow the Spirit of God to keep you secure in His presence from this stronghold. Depression. Depression is an epidemic that University of the Pennsylvania researcher Martin Seligman estimated cost Americans up to $4 billion in lost work or medical bills. Its social cost is enormous. Broken marriages, troubled children, suicide, or even homicide. The National Institution of Mental Health says one in every five Americans, 40 million people, have significant symptoms of depression at any one time. About two to four million of them suffer severe clinical depression. Depression is the oldest psychiatric disorder. You hear what I just said? Depression is the oldest psychiatric disorder. Why? Because it brings you to a place of self-pity. It brings you to a place where you shut yourself down, lock yourself in your mind, hold all your thoughts to yourself. You don't share what's going on in your mind, what's hurting you or what's bothering you. So you imprison it in your treasure box. So it keeps you in a place, in a state of depression. But scientists still don't know what causes it, much less why most of these victims are women. The first step, I found in dealing with Christian people that one of the first steps down the road to depression is a neglect or loss of interest in God's word. They become so taken up with the process of living that they neglect the basic spiritual exercise that require all who wish to maintain their Christian experiences. After a time, these people begin to feel the weights of serving because the joy of the Lord has ebbed out of their lives and they are left with a dull mechanics of Christian living. They begin withdrawing from their responsibilities as they retreat behind the walls to seek seclusion they feel is needed. But withdrawal demands with more withdrawals until loneliness becomes a way of life. So you withdraw from other people and responsibilities until you to withdrawal becomes a part of your life. So you get into a place of seclusion and you feel alone, feel like nobody cares, you feel like you're abandoned. So you get to that place where you don't want, want nobody to even know what's going on. So you wear a smile on your face, but deep within your heart, you're crushed, you're broken, you're torn. It takes too much to bother people and to invite people over for dinner anymore. Life takes on the sameness that becomes more and more like a dark tunnel without an exit. So it leads you from, from the state of depression to suicide. So once you get to the state of suicide, now you're ready to end your life. You feel like, well, why do I need to live? I'm worthless. I'm nobody important. No one cares about me. No one visits me. No one comes sees about me. No one checks on me. So all this stuff, I'm hurt. I've been slandered. I've been torn. I've been ripped to shreds. I messed up my life. I made mistakes. No one cares about me. So that down, down mood brings to a place of paralysis. So now I'm paralyzed with the thoughts of failure and discontentment now I just want to take my life. But the devil is a liar. Because God says. He sent this word to heal you. And deliver you. From every destruction. Not only that. God says in his word. David said I cried to the Lord. And he heard me. And delivered me from all my fears. God promises to deliver us. When we give in to him. And allow him to deliver us. Deliverance will not take place unless you want to be delivered. There are many people who are comfortable with the mindset of suicide. They're comfortable with the mindset of failure. They're comfortable with the mind and the attitude of depression. So if you try to tell them something outside of the norm, they become discombobulated because they can't handle it. They can't deal with it. 
So they find themselves reverting back into that shell when no one cares. And God wants us to know tonight that the spirit of heaviness must be broken off your mindset. You cannot continue to allow yourself to be imprisoned with the spirit of heaviness where it's destroying your entire life. Because that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. Kill, steal, and destroy. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 19 says, When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift a standard against him. God promises that when the enemy comes to attack yourself to your mind, he will lift a standard, a covering, a protection against the enemy. Even King Saul had a spirit of heaviness. And he called for David to play the harp to calm his spirit. We all sometimes get victimized by the enemy with the spirit of heaviness. But if you don't know how to master it, it's going to master and control you. Then it says, another scripture, Know ye not that whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom to obey. Whether be of sin unto death, or obedience unto righteousness. So whoever and whatever you decide to submit your, your authority to, that's whose servant you become. You become a slave to sin unto death or a slave to righteousness unto God. Then you have to be aggressive. We have to be aggressive against this spirit of heaviness. You cannot passively handle the spirit by yourself you cannot just precariously just go through life lackadaisically trying to deal with the spirit of heaviness no you gotta be strong you gotta be stern you gotta be bold you gotta put, put, uh, stand on guard with your weapons put on the full arm of God to stand against the wiles of the devil be aggressive don't yield to those dark moods and depression use the word of God like a sword that is slashed the way at the enemy who is robbing you of your joy and your peace and your contentment that should be yours as a child of God. Their symptoms of depression starts. Just loose the garment of praise. When the symptoms of depression starts, loose the garment of praise and the oil of joy to cover you from head to toe. Allow praises to flow from your thoughts and your mouth. That is a key point. That's a vital point. When you find the spirit of heaven is trying to come upon you. You know, sometimes I can be around certain people, be full of joy and excitement and vitality. But also you get around a person who has an unclean spirit or a negative spirit on them. You get the spirit of heaven that's come upon you and you're like, where'd that come from? I wasn't feeling like that before. And all of a sudden now, my mind is changing. I'm starting to feel miserable. I'm feeling bitter. And the moment I recognized that spirit, I said, Satan, you're a liar. This is not from God. I command you to go in Jesus' name. Guess what? It's gone. Why? Because I took authority over that spirit so it had no power or influence over me. Allow the praises to flow from your thoughts to your mouth. It may require discipline on your part. But the more you praise God, you got to practice righteousness. You got to practice praising God. You got to practice putting on the full armor of God on a daily basis. And the more you use your prayer language, that's being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, that language that only God knows by His Spirit. If you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, make it a priority in your life. That's evidence of the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about speaking in tongues. But if you don't speak in tongues, it's okay because some people will never speak in tongues. But that's okay because God's Spirit is still dwelling in you. Be obedient to God's Word. I want you to pray with me. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I don't especially feel like praying. I'm doing it in obedience to your word. Forgive me for neglecting my time of prayer with you and the reading of your word. I've allowed the spirit of heaviness to rob me of the good things you have for me. 
But I promise to reject those thoughts of self-pity. But I praise you, God, right now. And I thank you for your promises that you have for me, God. And I neglect self-pity. And I make praise to you, O oh God, as a way of life from this time forward. Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus in the spirit of heaviness, according to Matthew 18, 18, which promise whatsoever I shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. I recognize that you have taken advantage of me. Now I resist you in the name of Jesus. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Go in in the name of Jesus and don't bother coming back. Go in the name of Jesus and don't bother coming back. Go in the name of Jesus and don't bother coming back. We have to tell the devil, the spirit of heaviness, go in the name of Jesus and don't bother coming back. Our victory. Thank you, Father, for delivery from the trap of the enemy. According to Matthew 18, 18, which says, Whatsoever you shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I loose the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, and the garment of praise and the oil of joy. I praise your holy name. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy. I thank you for hearing and answering my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, receive the freedom. Acknowledge by faith that the Spirit is broken off of your life. And allow the Word of God to sanctify you, to purify your thoughts to change your thinking. Read Romans 12, 1 and 2. That you learn how to present your body a living sacrifice to God. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Allow Him to change your thinking by the renewing of the Spirit. As you get into God's Word, God's Word promises to renew you, to refresh you, to revive you, to strengthen you, and to empower you. To be able to deal with any attack, any stronghold the devil throws your way. As you dwell in the safety of the Most High, Psalm 91 and 1, God will cover you with his, weather, his feathers. He'll protect you and keep you secure in his presence. So Lord God, tonight I thank you for this word. I pray that they have not fallen from deaf ears. But they that have ears to hear will hear what the Spirit says to the church. Will be convicted, will be changed will be reproved, will be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and be filled with your presence. In Jesus' name, we bind the strong man and all his cohorts and his attacks that come against the people of God right now. And we cast them down at your feet, God. And we thank you that we have been redeemed from the curse of law, sin, and death, washed in the blood, and filled with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And then those of you who don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, would you pray this prayer with me tonight? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come asking you, Lord God, to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly. My past, my present, and my future sins, oh God, wash me in the blood of the Lamb. And Lord, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit and that with power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You prayed that prayer. Welcome to the family of God. The angels in heaven are rejoicing over you because you made that decision, that choice to give God your heart tonight. Stay encouraged until next week. Be excited about Jesus. Tell others about the class that we're doing. Facebook Live every Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Next week, we're going to start a subject, the spirit of whoredoms. The spirit of whoredoms. We're going to start discussing next week concerning the spirit of whoredom, which is like dealing with adultery and dealing with um, harlotry and unfaithfulness. And until next week, stay encouraged, stay excited about Jesus, and know that he loves you, he cares about you. And so I love you, and God loves you too. Have a good night. Shalom. Peace be to you.